Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on the time zone where you're joining us from. Welcome to panel five of the 11th Annual Cambridge International Law Conference. This session is on challenges for global governance, and it is my pleasure to introduce your chair for this session. Dr. John Barker is a fellow of the Lauterpath Center of International Law and director of Cambridge Governance Lab. His principal areas of current professional engagement are governance risk, environmental law, administrative justice, and human rights. As former chairman of the Foreign Compensation Commission, Foreign and Commonwealth Office, his area of focus was international claims. With professional experience in Africa spanning for more than 30 years, he has advised the UNDP, Office of the Human, of, sorry, Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, European Commission, CIDA, and DFID on the promotion of the rule of law, anti-corruption strategies, and transition justice. Without any delay, let's get started. The floor is all yours, Dr. Barker. Thank you, Tuba, and welcome to panel five, in which we're going to look at some of the ch uh, challenges of global governance that were mentioned by Maja in her uh, really excellent keynote. One of the challenges is understanding the complexities of governance from different angles at different levels, and that is definitely going to happen here this morning. Uh, we're going to be ranging from binding international law and intergovernmental organizations through to soft law and major influence influencers uh, such as civil society and the private sector. Um, there are worrying signs, as Maja indicated, that certain global threats are running faster than we are. And in order to get a grip, we need a greater alignment of purpose closer cooperation, targeted deployment of adequate resources and coordination of efforts, as well as obviously institutional design and development. We also know that global governance is not monolithic. It doesn't look anything like a sovereign state on a grander scale, although rules-based systems and compliance are essential. There's a much greater diffusion of effort among many stakeholders. And this, in fact, is one of the many challenges uh, that we face and that Maja alluded to. This will be well illustrated by our speakers this morning. Um, but there's no getting away from the fact that we do need a rules-based system to confront the raw and unconstrained exercise of arbitrary power, and that we need good governance at every level. And in fact, I would suggest that the international community needs to develop a better understanding of governance, particularly and ironically at national level, because that is where the most unhealthy monopolies over pow uh, power uh, reside. We need to recognize governance risk as a central challenge that underpins so many of the specific risks that Maja outlined. Now I propose to introduce each presenter um, at the time they give their presentations. We don't expect further technical glitches, but if that should happen, uh, if they're, they're cut off for any reason, I'll simply give them time to reconnect while I introduce the next speaker. So we make good use of the time. If it takes longer for them to return, then we'll just continue to the end of the, the following talk and queue them up to complete their presentation. I just mentioned that so that you know what to expect. So we begin with a presentation by Emmanuel Safa Abdullahi. Uh, uh, Emmanuel is an eminent legal scholar, author, and civil society practitioner working on democracy and human rights in Sierra Leone, as well as in other parts of Africa. He's acting head of uh, Department of Legal Studies at the University of Sierra Leone and executive director of the society for democratic initiatives. He teaches criminal law and international humanitarian law, among other subjects, and chairs the political affairs cluster of the African Union's Economic, Social, and Cultural Council. He's well placed to speak to us on Africa's perspectives on global governance, of the positive and negative influences of international law and institutions in Africa, and Africa's growing influence on the development of international law. Emmanuel, over to you. 
Thank you very much, John, and uh, good morning from Lusaka to everyone. And let me share my screen. If I could. Um, my presentation basically is going to focus on um, Africans' role in the international global government system. Um, as you all know, Africa is not, um, like we say, a monolith. It's made up of several countries and uh, 54 countries now. So we're going to look at what has happened to Africa over the last 50 years in terms of uh, its involvement and engagement with international law. In order to do this, uh, my presentation is going to be divided into um, I'll start with the introduction, of course, and then look at various theoretical debates on how this engagement has ensued. And we'll look at uh, the historical trace of the relationship between Africa and international law, looking at uh, decolonization, racial equality, human rights and good governance was an international intervention. And when I talked about the historical trend, trace, basically it's going to look at the post-independence uh, era. Then we'll skip to the 21st century where Africa has interacted with democracy, rule of law, and constitutionalism, and has basically innovated the new international law on outlawing of constitutional change of government. In, in economic integration and, and in poverty, and then looking at um, environment protection and HIV. Now, to start with, it's important to note that um, most African countries have had a long relationship with international law, but clearly, this is something that we have to start with looking at what happened after 1960s when many of the African countries um, gained independence from their colonial masters and decided to form new states um, immediately. Um, what happened after that is basically African countries, most of them at that point in time actually, instituting one party dictatorship. At the same time, the United Nations was being formed and other multinational agencies were taking shape. And uh, there were issues already with African stability, um, uh, ranging from various challenges of governance. Therefore, it was an opportune time for you know international partners to come in to help this new imagine. Um, you also note that African uh, from their colonial masters and portray themselves as international, I mean, portray themselves internationally as, as independent nations. Um, this really created an opportunity for international law interaction with the continent and the Organization of African Unity, which is the OAU, now it's the AU, in March, the Organization of African Unity uh, organizations in Europe and in the United Nations. Now, um, this is basically the evolution of the beginning of the interaction between Africa and international uh, law. However, there has been different schools of thought as to the relationship and how it has ensued. And these two theories, they are basically two predominant theories. One of them is the contributionist theory and the other is a critical approach to this relationship. Now, each one of these theories clearly are founded on the basis of ideological acceptance and rejection of multilateralism. Let's start with the issue of contributionist theory, which was led by um, Taslim Olawole, who was the former judge of the International Court of Justice. He's basically said that, you know, um, in terms of Africans' relationship with international law, we should begin by thinking of what he is the inter-civilization participation in the process of crafting genuine universal norms, meaning that Africa has played a significant role in basically the evolved, evolving or development of um, international law. It's not only about it, but contributing international law civilization, rather than what they refer to as um, Eurocentric notion that um, international law 
emerge or develop from Europe. Now the contribution is trying to rewrite the history of international legal, legal studies and trying to discard Eurocentricity and accommodate Africans' role in, in, in the development of international law. Now, the contributionists basically reject earlier notions and redefine classification of Africans as a backward and uncivilized and barbaric nation in international history. And this is what Felix, one of those, those proponents, Felix Okay, he said. He said that their intention was to correct his records to rescue the Africans from their assigned place in history by glorifying a bygone where the Africans, much like Europe, was a number of ancient kingdoms or political units equivalent to the modern uncivilized state. Now, the contribution is therefore challenged what they call the myth of black inferiority, servitude, and backwardness. Um, the next school of thought is the critical theory. Critical theory basically explains African international law has been used as an instrument to further subjugate Africa to international domination. These theories include um, people like Kamari, Clark, Macau, Mutua, and Oberi Okafo. Now, they basically said international law continues to be the legacy of colonialism and persistent disempowerment of Africa. And therefore, they focus, unlike the contributionists, they focus on trying to defang international law of its imperial in general. So the focus really was predominantly on power and wealth balance, imbalance between Africa and the world, and as a point of departure, that international law was not a system that was created to lead to reforms at the international system, simply transforming itself into a public and private neocolonialism and imperialism, which is facade of progressiveness. They went on to say political independence and self-determination is a new vehicle to further subjugation of the, F of the history of Europe of the history of Europe against Africa, sorry. So they see self-determination as a moment of betrayal, not returning Africa to its past glory will enhance reciprocal exchange. Now they also view international law that he has emerged from what they call industrial capitalism in the West and the territorial ambition of Western nation. Therefore, international law is the head maiden of colonialism. Now, that is what the critic says. What uh, basically this paper, this presentation is presenting is what I call the voluntary theory. This presentation basically, this theory basically is saying that unlike the two theories that are blaming each other, that African nations volunteer to join international legal framework and institutions such, such as the pretty world institutions, extractive industry and open government partnership for various reasons. But two of the main reasons include financial benefit and emanating from being a member and the global status that these countries will get, you know, from joining these institutions, particularly at a time when the African leaders were now looking to legitimize themselves and their actions based on international acceptance. So importantly, um, as, a, as, 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 as a theory, the voluntary theory which I'm proposing predates the explosion of globalization because post-independent states at the point when they we're trying to be part of the international system, volunteer to join institutions like the United Nations and, and the Commonwealth. Now, let us move next to the issue of the historical trace. Now, it is very important for us to note that Africa is basically a country that has homogeneous um, societies, you know, and uh, therefore it presents a very interesting case for the evolution of international law or sometimes resistance and development. After the World War, there was there, after the World War, which basically witnessed um, immense human suffering, um, the world decided there was a need for some form of regulatory framework for international relations. At this point, when the UN was formed, it was at the same time that Africa was viewed as appendage to their colonial masters. Uh, along that line, the African nations were basically voting based on what their colonial masters wanted. However, the United Nations, when it was formed, 
aimed at the principle of equality and international law. And therefore, it was time for African nations to be used as a testing ground for this principle of equality and international law. So the first test of international law in Africa was actually the issue of decolonization. After the end of the war, it became very clear that colonialism was now unfashionable. Um, superpowers no longer wanted to have territories that they were funding because they also had grim eco um, economic situations and could no longer fund those territories. Now, at the same time, during the World War II, African soldiers who were looking at their colonial masters as gods um, discovered that they were human, human beings after all, because they all fought in battles and they saw them die, you know, and just like the, the, the African soldiers. So it was no longer an issue of um, um, being afraid of anybody. Um, based on this, the United Nations principles of self-determination, social progress and advancement of all people was very ripe at this point in time. And it was clearly against, uh, go, went against the issue of colonialism. It was a duty to end colonialism. So United Nations then adopted the Universal Declaration on Human Rights which did not explicitly say anything on, intern, on, on decolonization, but it laid the foundation for further instrument, like the Declaration on Granting of Independence to Colonial Countries and People, which was adopted in the 1960s. This Declaration on Principles on Colonial Countries call for not only granting of self-independence to colonial territories, but created what we call a different urged nations of people who were colonial um, territories to create their own state. Now, this was followed by um, several other conventions, I mean, um, including the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and the, the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. All of these international instruments basically ask for um, uh, self-determination of people. Uh, the next issue, which, which was really very important and, and which is very interesting, was the issue of the United Nations using sanctions for racial equality. You know, at, at the point when um, many states were emerging as um, independent nations, there were still issue of colors. You have, you know, white superiority subjugating blacks, you know, and other colors. So the United Nations decided it was time to use sanctions to ensure racial equality. And there are two glaring examples that are worth mentioning. One of them was Rhodesia and the other in South Africa. The Security Council of the United Nations basically imposed sanction in 1968 against the Rhodesia government. And in 1970, they did the same and imposed an embargo, an arms embargo on, 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 on South Africa. Now, the Security Council called on member states of the United Nations, you know, not to invest in South Africa because of the apartheid system. They also went to, to ban or outlaw procuring arms and ammunition or selling arms to South Africa and, and Rhodesia uh, because they believed that it threatened international peace. Now, in, in terms of Rhodesia, as we all know, the Smith government unilaterally declared independence. United Nations control, condemned the taking of power by what it called the racist white minority and called for non-recognition of Rhodesia by the international community. And this was despite the fact that um, Rhodesia had met all the traditional requirements of being a nation. The UN said, no, I mean, I mean, so long as the government was based on racial distinction, there was no way they were going to allow the, the state of Rhodesia to exist. So for the first time, the principle of non-recognition emerged against any state that failed to adhere to the notion of non-discrimination and minority rule. Now, this same principle was applied in South Africa when the Blacks, or Black South Africans decided to form a state of what they call Bantusa. Now, the United Nations frowned at it and both Rhodesia and, and Bantusa never, never and they were never recognized by the international community. The next issue we're going to look at is how human rights and good governance was used as an issue of international law interaction with Africa. Now, it's coinciding with the formation of African statehood was the, it was the entrenchment of fundamental human rights in international human rights law. Um, at this time, many African countries were drafting their constitution. And as a result of that, they basically included the International Bill of Rights in most of these constitutions. 
and and in this constitution basically we are mirrored on the western counterpart who we are ahead in protection and promotion of human rights now the provision in the international covenant on civil and political rights um clearly we are way advanced than what you know most african nations would think and and then um, they decided that it was time to actually look into origin and, and cover it. um at the same time african governments were being assessed based on the progress that they have made in incorporating you know these provisions into international in, sorry international constitutional provision then international financial institution now also began assessing governments in africa based on the human rights records and and good governance benchmark uh, which next led to the fact that the legitimacy of governments in africa or their leaders were monitored and assessed based on their willingness and ability to meet western standards of democracy um, then it is important to, take, to talk about the issues of war and intervention of international human rights law. After the formation of the African nations, a lot of these states were unable to hold themselves together. Wars broke out and um, there were tribal or regional wars or ideological war, particularly at a point when um, the Cold War was raging. So many nations were already becoming failed states before they, were, they even began governing themselves. Now, three countries come to mind, Somalia, Burundi, and Rwanda were immediate failed states. This was later joined by countries like Sierra Leone, Liberia, and Zaiden, which is now Democratic Republic of Congo. At this point in time, um, because of these wars, humanitarian catastrophe was looming and the United Nations was obligated to interfere to intervene in this failed state and defend their sovereignty. Now, it was a matter of interpreting chapter seven by the United Nations to continue to spread the notion of sovereignty and to ascertain what the ramifications were for international law. For example, in 1992, the United Nations established the first peacekeeping, one of the first peacekeeping missions in, in Somalia, you know, in, in not under the pressure for um, providing humanitarian assistance. And there are several examples afterwards. In, in all of this nice relationship or integration or help that came from, from international law, there were issues of cultural diversity and clash. It, it wasn't a bed of rose that the international community just worked in and helped Africa, uh, you know. There were instances when, you know, the African country to reconcile the international Emmanuel, particular principles of human yes, please. I just uh, wanted to say that some of sometimes your sound is fading. Uh, it's oh. been a pretty good run so far, but it was starting to interrupt again. So uh, two possibilities is to use a microphone. Other is to switch video off so that all of your bandwidth is going for your sound and uh, whatever you think works best would be would be helpful. I do, well, I didn't I didn't notice that, but is it clear now? It, you're you're quite clear now. It's just that at earlier stages and just a, a minute ago, it was starting to fade out again. Um, okay. the, com the compression is pretty good, but it doesn't always work. Um, so the, the switching video off, although we do really like uh, to see you and that particular background is <laughs> inspiring, but uh, it might it might help to turn the video off and that way we get the full benefit that's, of the sound. That's okay. I, I, I have to say I am sitting at the airport in Lusaka <laughs> waiting for my flights, so right. I'm just switching in between networks. That's um, fine. No, that, anyway, so, that, that may help, but, but then do come back on after you're finished with video. Okay. Thanks. That's fine. Carry on. Okay, so uh, um, so we're talking about cultural diversity and, and clashes, and and this takes us to what uh, you know Samuel Huntington said. He says um, the nation state will remain an important factor or player in modern days. Cultural differences will form the basis or the major sources of conflict in the 21st century. Yeah. And as we know, I mean, like I said from the onset, Africa is not a monolith. There are several countries, and these countries have you know, numerous tribes and religion. Uh, even before African or African came into contact with Christianity and Islam, there were hundreds of 
of thousands of local indigenous religious traditions. So when the international law started interacting with um, the African states, some of the dictates of, of international law basically conflicted with, with um, and they still conflict, not just conflict, they, they still conflict with um, the tribal and regional issues that exist. And, and, and I think it's important to note that this, this religious diversity or cultural you know, heterogeneity determines mainly where states stand on international issues. Sometimes it's really just a matter of uh, um, leaders in Africa looking at where the religious divide leans towards international issues. But one of the things that I wanted to mention, and I think maybe uh, one or two of them, but is the issue of marriage, which was um, 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 legislated, as I can say, um, in the in in the convention against all forms of discrimination against women you know it says women have a right to choose their partners who they marry to this goes against most of the african culture at that point in time and this was a major point of clash and african leaders were not willing to take a risk to ensure that they push human rights even as we speak there are various various uh, challenges about you know, um, sexual minorities, where African leaders have said, even less than five years ago, openly that in some countries that, you know, they're never going to legislate or, or encourage um, um, sexual minorities to be recognized, even in countries that we, we think are much more progressive in, in terms of their evolution, countries like Ghana, like Uganda, you know. Now, clearly this, this shows that there, there are conflicts everywhere. Um, issues like FGM, um, female genital mutilation, remains a major issue in the continent. And there has been no consensus among this. So, uh, like I said, the relationship has not been as smooth as just intervening or helping new states that we imagine and, and trying to save them from, from that. Basically, um, Emmanuel, we, we've got, I've just got a signal that we've just got uh, a, a few more minutes to wrap yes. up. So yes, absolutely. over to you. So, so um, the next few things that we just quickly talk about is the, the issue of um, what happened in 21st century. Democracy has been a major push by international bodies and African states have accepted democracy, particularly in the 1990s as a means of of governance, even though there have been much contestation whether democracy was was in Africa before, um, even even before colonialism came into effect, and that's a debate for another day. Um, the one significant thing I want to talk about is the introduction of the African Charter on Democracy, Elections, and Good Governance. This is one of the conventions that I think Africa is making a lot of contribution to, to the international law system by outlining what is called outlawing on constitutional change of government. It's the first time that an international treaty has basically said, um, no more military coups, you cannot change government through mili military intervention or constitutional means. And if you do manage to do that, African countries should ensure that they arrest whoever is the coup plotter and ensure that they face trial. So this is a significant um, stuff that I wanted to bring to the attention in this discussion. But also to look at the role of international criminal justice in reducing war crimes and crimes against humanity. Now, before um, we started start setting up international criminal court, there were wars in, in, in the continent in several countries where human, human beings were being slaughtered and human violations were everywhere. But since uh, Rwanda and the setting up of the International Criminal Court for Rwanda and few others, including the Special Court for Sierra Leone, there seems to have been a reduction in wars where, you know, um, egregious violations of human rights will occur with reckless abandon. And I think this is a significant interaction and, and role that international court has brought, uh, international law has brought to, to Africa. There's also the issue of economic integration. Um, where Africa is trying to look at how, what has happened in the European Union, creating a bigger market by, by establishing the African continent of free trade. Before that, they've created the ECOWAS, SADC, and the Comasi um, common markets to ensure that you know, Africa can, can now make use of itself. So in, in essence, and in, in conclusion, it, it is very clear that you know, international law and Africa have had an interesting relationship. So sometimes it's about uh, international law pushing um, human rights issues through uh, and ensuring that African countries and governments live by it. There's times when the African themselves have developed unique laws. And for example, we look at what has happened in Malawi in 2000 when the Constitutional Court 
upheld it, um, their constitution on elections. That's a very interesting example to look at uh, as Africans' contribution to, to international law and, and creating new jurisprudence. Um, thank you very much. I hope um, I haven't taken much of the time and I hope this explains um, some of the things that I want to talk about. Thank you. Good. Thank you very much, Emmanuel, for a fascinating account um, uh, that, that has major implications, I think, not just within Africa, but beyond. Um, I think perhaps the most recent evidence of Africa's strong leadership role in the governance context, global governance context, is the statement made by Martin Kimani, Kenya's permanent representative to the United Nations during the UN Security Council debate on the Ukraine. Um, you may have heard it because it went viral, um, but I can't think of a more mature and statesmanlike representation of the African position, and I commend it uh, to everyone to, to give that a, a, a listen. Um, we now turn to our next presentation on the interface between international law and science. This is especially important as we can see this issue at play in the context of the pandemic. In fact, not only does policy suffer when we are untethered from science, but we also see harm done to citizens' confidence in public institutions. And that goes to the question of governability of populations. In the context of the Ukraine, we also see a different kind of untethering, which is from history and even from the meaning of words um, in, in the fairy tale spun by uh, Vladimir Putin to justify his interventions in Ukraine, as well as obvious challenges to an international rules-based system that constrains power-based systems. If we're going to get a grip on climate change, science-based policy is especially important. And so models being developed in the Arctic fisheries context, for example, have much wider significance. Now, uh, there are going to be two speakers on this one. Um, Mehdi uh, Dervovic is a public international lawyer with expertise in the law of the sea and its applications in the polar regions, particularly in relation to Arctic governance. He has an LLM in polar law from the University of Akureyri in Iceland and holds a research position at the Stephenson Arctic Institute, where he examines international and regional standards and case law on minorities and indigenous peoples. He's also a visiting researcher in the Arctic Governance Research Group at the Arctic Center based at the University of Lapland in uh, Rovaniemi in Finland. And if you consult a map, you'll see that he spends most of his time above the 65 degree north latitude, which is really impressive. Um, also presenting is uh, Katarina Heinrich, who is at the, uh, also at the Arctic Center in Rovaniemi. Like Mehdi, she holds a master's degree in polar law from the University of Akureyri and uh, taking master's of resource management degree in coastal and marine management at the University Center of West Fjords, Iceland, also above 65 degrees latitude. She works on Arctic and Antarctic uh, law and policy, environmental law, marine biodiversity, conservation and management, and the rights and contributions of indigenous peoples. We hand the floor over to you to talk about linkages between science and law in this important context. Thank you very much for introducing us, Dr. Barker. We are very happy to be here today. Um, let us share our presentation quickly before we start off. I think it's on there. Yeah. Okay. I hope uh, you can hear us um, well and can see our presentation. So, as Dr. Baca already introduced, we're going to talk today about the law science nexus in international lawmaking, and we'll um, illustrate that on um, Arctic fisheries governance. We're going to start out. Um, 
talking about the emerging necessity to integrate science and international lawmaking, followed by outlining some of the challenges for the law science nexus. After that, we will go further into the Central Arctic Ocean Fisheries Agreement, um, where we will illustrate the role of science within the negotiations and the implementation of the agreement, um, with lastly illustrating some conclusionary remarks. I will give the floor to Mili right now. Thanks, Katarina. Sorry. So in the latter part of the 20th century, there were noticeable international legal efforts to address urgent issues like climate change and biodiversity loss. To ensure their effectiveness, these efforts required solid um, scientific knowledge of these natural phenomena, which are amplified by anthropogenic activities. Accordingly, and given the nature of these environmental issues, these international efforts came in response to the developing scientific understanding of these um, the adverse effects of climate change on the earth systems, biodiversity, but also on humankind. Indeed, based on such scientific evidence, the international community identified the emerging necessity to mitigate climate change. In particular, in 1988, the United Nations General Assembly formally recognized climate change as a common concern of humankind thus implying the need to address this transboundary threat in a collective manner. Later in 1992, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change and the Convention on Biological Diversity were adopted. Both emphasized the crucial character of science in developing and implementing these legal frameworks. Moreover, both conventions established sub, uh, subsidiary scientific bodies tasked to inform decision makers on the best scientific knowledge available. However, these scientific bodies are advisory only, which leads us to view the integration of science in these treaties as incomplete. Now, if we consider uh, regional fisheries management mechanisms, the role of science therein appears more informative than normative. While management measures are essentially based on scientific considerations uh, regarding, for example, the abundance or the maturity of selected fish stocks, they do not always follow the scientific reality. In fact, parties to certain regional fisheries management organizations often have the possibility to object to uh, management measures under certain circumstances. Altogether, in some areas of international law, science gave the impetus to develop general legal frameworks to tackle new or at least newly prioritize environmental challenges. In other instances, science plays an informative role only where it should be at, at the forefront and have a stronger normative influence to reach the mitigation objectives fixed by the international community. Now I'll let Katarina talk about the general challenges that we identified for the integration of science in international law. Yes, thank you. So the integration of science in international lawmaking present many opportunities. But they also come with challenges, which I would like to briefly outline. Um, so by investigating global environmental law instruments and their processes, such as the UNFCCC and the CBD, we were able to identify main challenges, which define and shape the role of science within the international legal order. One of these challenges also was brought up in literature oftentimes, is the politicization of science. Thereby, both governments and scientists have been criticized of influencing the degree of science in policy and or lawmaking. For instance, through the composition of these science bodies, as well as their mandate under environmental law instruments, a watered-down role of science can result and often inherits a large political influence. What I mean by that is that the scientific bodies under international environmental law instruments often only have an advisory role like MIDI outlined before already and are composed to a large extent of government representatives. In addition to that, their work might be guided by superior bodies, such as, uh, such as in the case of the conference of the parties to the Convention on Biodiversity. Um, this direct, directs the tasks of this advisory body. As a consequence, the political influence is omnipresent by default, even though an objective of these processes is often the integration of independent science. Furthermore, advisory bodies often fulfill the role to filter the scientific information provided by the expert bodies. 
Thus, they are bridging the gap between science and law by facilitating the understanding of scientific reports, such as in the case of the subsidiary body under the UNFCCC conference of the parties, for example. Therefore, we concluded that science, even though attributed an increasing importance in international environmental law, remains with a secondary role in the international legal order with the scientific bodies being only as effective as the politics or governance structures allow it. A further challenge shaping the role of science in international legal instruments refers to the scientific uncertainty and the term best available scientific information. Today, I want to briefly outline the challenge of scientific uncertainty. The fact that the Earth systems are dynamic, extremely complex and interconnected results in a high uncertainty of scientific information on ecosystems and how they are impacted by predicted changes. Consequently, science is required to constantly evolve and develop throughout time to increase the understanding of these systems. This results in an imbalance between the dynamic nature of science and the static nature of legal frameworks which also has a spillover effect on the normative impact of science in international law. Now, after outlining the general necessity to integrate science in international lawmaking and its challenges, we briefly want to outline how these objectives and challenges are translated to the fisheries management of the Central Arctic Ocean high seas portion. Predictive future changes in the Central Arctic Ocean, such as continued sea ice loss and the northward shift of fish stocks, and the uncertainty whether these potential fish stocks might be commercially viable in the future, have led to the recognition that potential activities require regulation before they arise. And contrary to past experiences where fish stocks, for example, first were exploited almost to extinction before adequate regulation was negotiated. Therefore, the Central Arctic Ocean Fisheries Agreement was established to create a de facto moratorium on commercial fishing in the high seas portion of the Central Arctic Ocean. With a short overview of the necessity to establish a regulation of potential commercial fishing activities in the Central Arctic Ocean, we will now dive a little deeper into the exact role of science in the negotiation and implementation within the Central Arctic Ocean Fisheries Agreement process. And I give the floor to Midi. So given our presentation focuses on the law science nexus in international lawmaking, it is important to mention and analyze the negotiation process of the Central Arctic Ocean Fisheries Agreement in this regard. As we see it, there are at least two distinct phases of uh, negotiation. First, building on the opening up of the Arctic Ocean and the potential economic prospects it could offer, the five Arctic coastal states, which are the United States of America, Canada, the Russian Federation, the Kingdom of Norway and the Kingdom of Denmark in respect to Greenland. So these five Arctic coastal states decided to anticipate unregulated high seas fisheries in the Central Arctic Ocean. What is important to notice in the first uh, phase is the symbiotic and balanced relationship between the diplomatic meetings and scientific meetings. Indeed, between 2010 and 2015, six diplomatic uh, and scientific meetings were held successively ensuring the ability of science to influence and feed directly into the diplomatic uh, meetings. Furthermore, scientists and state representatives uh, attended a meeting together in 2013. Eventually, this hybrid type of uh, negotiations nicely reflects the interplay between science and policy. The second phase of the negotiation was marked by the inclusion of China, Japan, the Republic of Korea, Iceland, but also the European Union in the following negotiations. Although there was only one scientific meeting between 2015 and the adoption of the agreement in 2018, the scientific information produced by the previous scientific meetings greatly influenced the diplomats to continue the negotiations while at the same time acknowledging information gaps on the Arctic Ocean, um, its marine living resources, and also the ecosystem in which they evolve. The second phase turned out to be more ambitious and innovative than initially planned, especially as the negotiation, the negotiate, sorry, the negotiating parties agreed in 2016 that the outcome of this process would be a legally binding instrument. Accordingly, this embodies the beginning of the law science nexus in the prevention of unregulated high seas fisheries in the Central Arctic Ocean. Now, when looking at the finalized uh, 
uh, agreement the significant role of science in influencing future developments of high seas fisheries management in the Arctic is remarkable in many ways. First, the agreement adopts what has been called a stepwise approach, meaning that due to the lack of scientific knowledge, the agreement represents the first step in the elaboration of a comprehensive high seas fisheries management framework for the Central Arctic Ocean. Secondly, uh, science is presented as a condition for future developments. This materializes, for instance, uh, with the establishment of the Joint Program for Scientific Research and Monitoring. This program is charged with answering questions regarding uh, the existence and distribution of fish stocks in the agreement area, the possibility to harvest these stocks sustainably, but also to identify the impacts of fisheries in the Arctic. Therefore, it is in charge of providing the necessary information, building the foundation for future fisheries management in the area. What is more, the Law Science Nexus uh, shine through the is anticipated role in the re review and implementation of the agreement. To conclude, there is a general consensus on the need to base legal regimes addressing environmental issues on the best scientific evidence available. As a matter of fact, the consideration of science as a core element of international environmental law is necessary and it also provides opportunities to improve and enhance decision and lawmaking. Nonetheless, as we illustrated in this presentation, there are varying degrees of integration of science in international lawmaking and its subsequent implementation. Whether science plays a secondary role or competes with economic interests, there is room for improvement by intensifying the law science nexus. When science is not integrated enough during the drafting of legal instruments, there are possibilities to adapt their implementation to strengthen the role of science in practice and also to overcome the challenges identified previously by Katarina. Eventually, we believe the genesis and functioning of the Central Arctic Ocean Fisheries Agreement can be used as an example towards better practices in international lawmaking. However, we do acknowledge that the rapidly changing environment of the Arctic, coupled with the absence of current commercial fishing activities in the Central Arctic Ocean, and the relatively low number of participants to the negotiations facilitating the advanced integration of science in the agreement. Thank you for your attention. And we look forward to your questions and remarks. Well, that's great. Thank you very much for your, to both of you for your joint contributions in such a crucial area. I was particularly pleased to see you mention scientific uncertainty um, as a normal process, because it is often misinterpreted in the political sphere and taken advantage of by detractors rather than understood as a normal process of refinement and debate. Um, so that's, that's an important point. And in fact, another area I think we need to keep a close eye on, in, in particularly from a scientific point of view, um, is the harm done uh, at all latitudes when Arctic ice loss um, uh, occurs because uh, it isn't just about biodiversity, we, we lose albedo effect and it's the reflective capacity of ice. And uh, I note that the Climate Crisis Advisory Group has warned that the heat domes over Europe and uh, the west coast of North America that we saw last summer and the incineration of, of, uh, of a whole town in British Columbia are directly uh, related to loss of ice. So uh, uh, best of luck with your important work and thank you for sharing with us. Now, uh, we were going to hear from Dr. Arpitha Kodaveri about how local communities are engaging in very novel ways with international institutions to enhance their voice and to leverage um, uh, their influence to address local problems, particularly in, in land disputes. And unfortunately, she's not able to join us. I hope that her paper will be made available because it really is interesting and, and an important contribution to our understanding of the co complex linkages between uh, local, um, national and international um, structures uh, that are all part of the governance, the global governance story. 
So instead, we'll go straight to Tubasa Sinohara, uh, Sinohara, who will speak to us on a novel topic that uh, reminds us that not all transnational activity operates through the institutions that we associate with global governance and states and intergovernmental institutions. In this case, the, it is the private sector that calls the shots, and uh, we have seen that for better or worse in other contexts. Um, uh, but uh, Tubas is well qualified to speak on this subject. Uh, in addition to his doctoral studies at the University of Lausanne, uh, he works uh, for the Swiss Esports Federation as a human rights officer. His main research field is sports and esports and human rights, and in particular, uh, non discrimination against intersex and transgender athletes. Uh, under international human rights law. So, Tubasa, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for introducing me, and then I try to share my screen. E yes. Can you see it? Good. Okay. Okay. So, thank you so much for introducing me, and also, my name is Tubasa Shinohara, is a PhD candidate in law. Uh, at the University of Lausanne, as John already said, and at the same time, I'm working for the Swiss Esports Federation as a human rights officer. And thank you so much for giving me such a great opportunity to have a presentation here, especially for the organization teams of this conference. Today, I will talk about global governance in international esports society with the question mark, because we don't know. And then this topic is really important in practice in Esports, because I am always faced with the difficulties to understand what international esports society is, because there are too many actors in esports. But I have to note that this presentation does not represent the SESF by my Swiss Esports Federation's opinion, but express my personal opinion. So let's. So I will give you a structure of this presentation. Firstly, I will explain the purpose and methods of my research. And secondly, and thirdly, I will answer two questions. And finally, I will answer the main question of this research to conclude this presentation. So let's begin. So eSports is electronic sports or a competitive video games, irrespective of online or offline games. Mostly competitive video games are online video games via internet connection with electronic device. Now, esports industry becomes highly attractive economic market to business enterprises. Some esports players become professional esports players to earn their livings through esports competitions and sponsoring contracts with business enterprises and the streaming uh, via Twitch, TV, or YouTube, etc. Unlike the international sports or sports governing bodies, international esports governing bodies cannot create their regulations and rules to bind all members within the international esports society. This is because they must conclude a licensed contract with esports publishers to use video games under intellectual property law. On this basis, esports publishers have a dominant power over the game community. For instance, I already uh, mentioned in the present uh, PowerPoint, Riot Games can exclusively govern a community of League of Legends under its copyright. In this context, international esports governing bodies can organize their esports competitions when they conclude an event licensing contract with esports publishers to use their video games as official esports events. In this situation, they are competent to govern all esports participants in the competitions under their regulations and rules. Based on this background, the purpose of this research is to consider how international esports societies should be understood under international law. In doing so, it will examine the following research questions. What is the concept of global governance? And how is the international esports society constituted? So firstly, I will consider what the concept of global governance is. So the concept of global governance has been considered as a framework of analysis or intellectual device for studying the complexity of global processes involving multiple actors that interact at different levels of inter, uh, inter, interest aggregation. Based on this definition, from my understanding, this should be considered 
that there is no clear definition of the concept of global governance. However, how has the concept of global governance has uh, been used in the context of international law? In this regard, scholars argued various opinions. So thus, I try to understand the concept of global governance as a situation where non-state entities govern the communities, including public and private actors, under their self-regulations and rules, with a question mark, because they try to define it. For we, uh, based on this understanding, the concept of global governance has been incorporated into the field of international law to understand the situation of governance in the absence of government. For instance, code of conduct, ILO conventions, the internet cooperation for assigned names and numbers created some of the self-regulation uh, self regulations and rules. So these self-regulatory situations seems to be recognized as a situation that the concept of global governance tries to understand because these non-state actors govern the, their specific community under the self-regulation rules that have a binding effect on all members within the community beyond national border. Therefore, the concept of global governance uh, should be understood as a research concept explaining the situation where the non-state actor uh, governs its community and its self-regulations and rules that have a binding effect on all members within its community, your national border or state jurisdiction. So based on this understanding of global governance, this section will consider how international esports society is constituted. The international esports society should be considered as a fragmented society due to the intellectual property rights of esports publishers. Therefore, esports publishers, as I mentioned before, have a dominant power over esports society. In this context, esports publishers may conclude and light, even licensing contract with esports governing bodies to organize international esports competitions. I will mention later, such as the IESF World Championship and GEF Global Esports Games. If the event licensing contract is successfully concluded, international esports governing bodies may govern all esports participants and sponsoring partner business enterprises in such events under their policies, regulation, rules. In light of the foregoing, the question that may arise is how esports publishers and international esports governing bodies govern the international esports society. As you can see, figure one, the international esports society is to be composed of esports publishers and dominant position, an international esports governing body, there is two, and the World Esports Association, World Esports Consortium, Esports World Federation, and Esports Integrity Commissions. And recently, International Esports Federation had a conclusion with the World Anti-Doping Agency. So uh, that is really difficult to understand in this society. So more precisely, Esports publishers and the international esports covering bodies may organize international esports competitions in the international esports society. As you can see, figure two, I classify international esports competition into esports publishers organized competition and the esports governing bodies organized competitions. In light of this situation, I will focus on considering how these esports competitions are governed by esports publishers and the international esports covering bodies. So, if esports publishers have organized several international esports competitions without the relationship with international esports governing bodies. So, for instance, the Inter Extreme Master organized by Electron Esports Leagues, and the EA Sports FIFA 21 Global Series organized by Electron Arts INC, and the League of Legends World Championship hosted by Light Games and the Fortnite World Cup organized by the Epic Games. That, that, these are just examples. There are so many uh, competitions that exist also. So these international esports competitions are governed by regulations and rules established by esports publishers. So in this context, how can esports publishers govern esports publishers organized competitions? In this regard, figure three, describes how they have relationship with esports participants, streaming platform providers, platform service providers, video game distributors, television and media, and sponsoring companies, Steka Steka. Each relationship is based on bilateral contracts with esports publishers, and therefore they may decide how to participate in esports competitions through their regulation rules. In particular, esports publisher may impose disciplinary sanctions, including fine, 
suspension and permanent ban on esports players due to the violation of the regulations and rules before, during, and after the esports competition. More importantly, this situation would allow esports publishers to organize esports competitions for each video game with a different policy for each competition. In this sense, the governance of esports competition can be considered as a fragmentation because there is no central governing body to set up a common regulatory framework applicable to all esports competitions. In this situation, Esports governing bodies cannot influence their activities without the license contract on the ground that esports publishers' activities may exclusively be protected by their intellectual property rights. In contrast to the esports publishers' organized competitions, international esports governing bodies may fall an international esports competition if they conclude a license contract with esports publishers to use their products as officially sanctions esports in the international esports competition. For instance, the Sardis Esports World Championship held in Israel from the 14 November to 20 November 2021, they use principally five competitive video games, Counter-Strike Global Offensive, and Dota 2 E FIFA PES 2021 Tekken 7 Audition Estega, but each year a little bit changed. <laughs> And the furthermore, GEF and the Singapore Esports Association held up global esports games in Singapore on the 18th, 29th December 2021 that selected following officially sanctioned esports Dota 2, eFootball TM 2021, and Street Fighter Azteca, but just three. So to use these video games in the esports governing bodies organized competition, ISF and GF must conclude event licensing contracts with each esports publishers to use them in the competition. In light of this situation, the figure four clearly describes the structure of esports governing bodies organized competitions. According to this, after the conclusion of event licensing contracts between international esports governing bodies and the esports publishers, the international esports governing bodies may create some regulations and rules applicable to all esports participants and business enterprises in their esports competitions. Therefore, the regulations and rules established by international esports governing bodies may require esports participants and business enterprises in the competition to implement some responsibilities or obligations. In this sense, it is clear that the international esports governing bodies can play a role in governing international esports competition by means of their regulation rules. Yes, this final section, oh no, <laughs> yes, this final section will answer the main question of how international esports society should be understood under international law. Let's see again what we discussed in this presentation. So what is the concept of global governance? I already mentioned before a situation where the non-state actor governs his community by means of the regulation rules with a binding effect of all members within its community beyond the national border. How is the international esports society constituted? One, esports publisher the organized competition exists, and no esports governing bodies organized competition exist as well. So according to this, this research clarified two points. One, no unified regulatory and governing bodies exist in the international esports society. And secondary, esports publisher have a dominant power over the international esports society under intellectual property rights of video games. So, in light of the foregoing, I will answer the main question in this research. Though, the main question is how should the international esports society should be understood under international law? Each esports competition governed by esports publishers or international esports governing body would be considered as part of the global governance model under international law. The, because no state actors govern their uh, community under the regulation rules with abiding effect all members within its community beyond national border. But on, in contrast, international esports society cannot be considered as a global governance model because there is no unified regulatory governing bodies in this society and there is no situation where a non-state actor governs its community under regulation rules that have a binding effect on all members within this community beyond national border. So through this, uh, through this research, to, uh, 
to enhance the governance level of international esports society, it should be established a unified esports governing body that can create the fundamental instrument as a common regulatory framework for the society. In doing so, this article suggests that uh, international esports governing bodies should play a significant role in providing for esports publishers and international forum with other esports uh, stake stakeholders. And secondary, esports publishers should limit their copyrights to achieve more effective governance of international esports society. But from my understanding, it appears that this situation is quite similar to the international community regulated by international law because the state has the sovereignty and then they try to conclude the treaties and then limit its executive rights. And then if, if the international uh, esports society can do it, that is also quite similar. So I try to do uh, the, this research in the, in the future, in the future. So, yeah. <laughs> so there are my SNS accounts. So if you are interested in my research, please follow my Twitter and LinkedIn. I also update the research gate in order for my research to be more visible. So free, uh, feel free to contact me in English, French, and Japanese if you can use in Japanese, yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much for your listening. And I hope we can see you again in person next year at Cambridge, if possible. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Tsubasa, for illuminating a subject that international lawyers don't get to hear much about. Um, but it is helpful to make comparisons and see what is coming around the corner in terms of the technology that joins more people up in different sectors in different spaces. There are definitely interesting parallels, as you point out. It also underscores the role of the private sector and uh, the question of self-regulation. Um, it also suggests, given some of the, the screens that you put up, that we have considerable competition given what else is on, uh, on offer online. So uh, it's a good thing that these are such interesting presentations. Um, our final speaker, uh, is also opening up new horizons as she discusses the invisible flow of water through conduits that we don't often think about, uh, but which are not only high impact, but also have the potential, if handled properly, uh, as she points out, to reduce tensions over water shortages. Marissa has an impressive career history. She holds a BA in Jewish ethics, uh, a BA in sustainable development and an MPA in environmental science and policy, those from Columbia University, uh, the last two, and uh, is now a JD candidate at Georgetown Law School in Washington, DC, and a master's candidate at Sciences Po Law School, Paris, where she is studying economic law and global governance. Uh, she's also uh, an entrepreneur uh, serving as a platform associate uh, at um, uh, supporting early um, stage water startups. Uh, also in 2017, she founded Eco Design Labs, where she continues to support entrepreneurs in the Middle East to innovate uh, solutions for water crisis facing uh, the region. And if that weren't enough, she also did some time with the US Department of Justice. Uh, Melissa, we look forward uh, to your presentation and over to you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Rucker, for the introduction. Um, and thank you to the Cambridge International Law Journal um, for the opportunity to speak today. So let me share my screen and we'll get going. Great. Water H2O, the fundamental molecule on which all life depends, is seemingly straightforward. Two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom held together by mutualistic covalent bonds. Few molecules are quite as simple, and even fewer substances are quite as pure. What makes water complicated is not its structure, but its distribution around the globe. It is deeply humbling irony that 70% of our planet is covered by water and yet 2.2 billion people 
a third of the global population lack access to clean, reliable sources of water. In Ukraine, families are melting snow and dismantling heating systems just to get a sip of water. And we see the disparities in the sector over and over again. Lack of access to water during a global pandemic when washing our hands is one of the best defenses. Water shortages in Syria and Yemen sparking agricultural fa failure, hunger, and political instability. The list goes on. Water is simple, but its distribution is far more complicated. My first week living in Jordan, the second most water scarce country on the planet, an American friend and his roommates went through their regular routine, showers, laundry, washing dishes. Nothing any of us would consider out of the norm. But two days later, when my friend went to brush his teeth, no water ran through the faucet. He was shocked. Had something happened? Was there an emergency shutoff? Not even in the slightest. My friend and his roommate had used a week's worth of water in two days. The next delivery to fill up the water basin sitting on their roof wouldn't be refilled until next Tuesday, and it was only Thursday. Working in the water sector, I've learned that my expectations of what should be urgent are often accepted as normal. Many communities have become accustomed to living with polluted, unreliable, and inconsistent water systems. They found ways to make do and are focused instead on employment, having enough money to send their kids to school, accessing healthcare, et cetera. And this mentality is deeply ingrained in the water sector as a whole and around the globe. Flint, Michigan is but another example of how we continue to accept a blaring problem. A few weeks after what became known as the toothbrush incident, I was on a bus going down to Aqaba in the south of Jordan when I passed fields of tomatoes and citrus fruits. It struck me as odd. Why on earth would Jordan be growing water intensive crops while their water supplies are rapidly depleting? Through further research, I learned that Jordan is a leader in the tomato export industry, as well as in bananas, a tropical fruit. The irony here is that Jordan is one of the leaders in employing the virtual water strategy, a key means of addressing the mismatch between availability and distribution in the water sector. Clearly, Something is amiss, so let me explain. Virtual water, a concept first coined by Professor John Allen, professor at King's College London, refers to the water, refers to the water encapsulated in production and movement of goods. Essentially, just as we calculate the carbon footprint for goods and services, we can also determine the water footprint, footprint for similar goods and services. And let me tell you, there's a lot of it. Water is required to grow crops, is woven into the fabric of our clothes, and manufactured in our electronics. A single smartphone requires over 12,000 liters of water to produce. Using water to produce is not bad on its own. The problem is that via virtual water, many water poor countries are essentially exporting water to water rich countries. In other words, the arrows for the most part are going in the wrong direction. But what if we could reverse the arrows? The virtual water concept has in truth been hailed as a potential solution to alleviate the global water crisis. The idea is that if we can account for water and goods and services, then we can in part adjust for the differences between location and need. While shipping water alone is quite costly given the sheer weight and volume of water, transporting the equivalent via goods and services is feasible. And Jordan and Israel are leading examples of countries that have shifted to importing virtual water. But Jordan's still growing bananas and Israel still grows watermelons. So what's going on? To understand the paradox, we have to first examine the global water governance regime. Water is governed by a variety of private, public, and nonprofit entities at the local, state, and international levels. The list includes water utilities, technology companies, international aid organizations, local government authorities, international government authorities, and nonprofit organizations. Unlike its parent three atom molecule, the water sector is incredibly segmented, complex, and diffuse. The level of coordination is tremendous because water often knows no boundaries and acts upstream have consequences on those far, far downstream. Water wars are, oft, are an oft-quoted theory, and although water is often not cause for war, we see time and again how water stresses political tensions. 
water governance therefore falls at the nexus of local and international laws and regulations. If we want to advance virtual water in the trade space, we have to consider how trade in virtual water interacts with the larger global water governance regime. Previous scholarship on virtual water is sparse. Edith Brown Weiss and Lydia Slobodian take up the cause in the seminal work on trade law and virtual water. Their paper, which takes a deep dive into the legal tools available to advance virtual water trade, outlines three primary options, water labeling, eliminating agricultural subsidies, and water pricing. Although challenging, Weiss and Slobodian contend that eliminating agricultural subsidies and putting a price on water are the best options. Water labeling and regulatory practices would likely be infeasible and labeling in, labeling in particular might be found to be de facto discrimination under US 202 and would therefore violate Article 2.1 of the TBT agreement. Essentially, the argument for vir virtual water trade mechanisms do not hold water on their own. That's not to say, however, that law cannot play a role. Law, in fact, is quite useful and necessary, but must be viewed in a larger context. Professor Katrin Coleman at Georgetown Law created a toolkit for law and development, which acts as a framework to analyze how development programs can be implemented through international law. The toolkit offers six lenses as a checklist to assess how law and legal tools are supporting development goals. They are human rights law, trade agreements, investment law, soft law, domestic law and regulation, and other sustainable development goals, targets, indicators. So let's take a look. In water, we have human rights law around the right to water, around a safe environment, on and on. For trade agreements, we have the WTO rules, the Paris Agreement, the Kyoto Protocol. In investment, we're looking at investments in and around the textile industry, the manufacturing sector, agriculture, and even utilities themselves. Soft law, we is plenty of language around water, and again, around the right to water. Under domestic law and regulation, there's precedent in terms of climate change law, um, as well as law around um, specifically um, municipal, municipalities um, and utilities. And lastly, we have the SDG 6, which is specifically the right to water uh, under the UN and the IPC reports. But the problem is we cannot take these laws at face value alone. The key is to understand how law shifts incentive structures to align with water needs. Jordan grows bananas and tomatoes because of the economic advantages. Although there is existing WTO law to penalize that action, enforcement in, in law because Jordan needs the economic benefits of exports. To help Jordan shift away from banana production, we need to incentivize the economy towards something else. In other words, we need more carrots and fewer sticks. If we want to employ virtual water, we need to redirect the incentives not only around water, but in a much broader context that accounts for the socio-political and economic factors that influence water governance. In chemistry, water is unique because unlike other substances, when water molecules come together to freeze into solid ice, the messiness of the water molecules normally swimming around as liquid water expand rather than contract to form a perfectly aligned crystalline structure. Water is messy and water is complicated, but if we can align local and international incentives with the realities of water needs, we might be able to form a more unified, coordinated global water governance regime. Thank you. Thank you very much, Melissa, for providing such an interesting finale and what a wonderful image of a structure in the form of water uh, being crystallized into ice. It's, uh, it's a great image. We should keep it on the screen. And you've chosen a crucial subject um, and are problem solving really in a most innovative way. Um, the insights and tools that you're developing in this context and reversing those arrows by understanding and working with such a wide list of stakeholders. These are relevant not only in that field, but in, in other subject areas. So uh, well done and thank you uh, for uh, uh, finishing off uh, this round.
it's really been a fascinating and illuminating discussion. Um, I think we're going to subject to anything that uh, our coordinators have to interject. I think we're going to go straight to questions and answers. Um, I'm going to rely on Tejas and Jane and Tuba, um, whoever's out there uh, coordinating, to select some of the questions coming in uh, so that our panelists can field them. Over to you. All right, yes. Um, so we have, um, so I'll read out the questions that we've got from the audience and then we can uh, leave the panel to discuss it. Uh, the first question that we have is from uh, George Darlington Hashaka, uh, who's the founder executive chairman of Uganda Peace Foundation based at Kampala, Uganda. So, uh, so he has two questions. The first one is from Mr. Emmanuel Safa. Uh, how can the practice of international law be fair and just when up to when up today Africa has no permanent member on the United Nations Security Council, the only organ of the United Nations that can institute legally binding resolutions? Um, should I read all the questions or um, would you like to um, answer this one and then we move to the next one? Emmanuel, do you want to feel that one straight away? I think you need to unmute. Um, I think you're on mute. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you very much, Judge, for that exciting question. I, and I think this is, this is if you, if you look into my paper, this is something that we was discussed briefly. Um, the, the, the issue of um, the inequality at the United Nations has been uh, ongoing for the last 50 years. And from what I presented today, you will see that this is a trend primarily because at the point when the United Nations was created, most African nations were not nation state. And, and then over the years, there's been a constant you know, campaign by, by the African Union. In fact, there is a group called the CETAN that is led by the president of Sierra Leone now advocating for a seat on, on, on the Security Council, a permanent seat. And, and in as much as it, my opinion is that I don't really see um, the Security Council and the United Nations as, as, as an institution that will solve uh, most of the problems, if you can see what is happening in Ukraine and you see the role that Russia is playing in trying to block actions that are, that are happening. But I think just symbolically, you need um, all regions represented on the body. And I think it's very important for the United Nations to reform. Um, the inequalities have been going on for too long and 60 years is quite a long time for, for kind of an equal treatment of all nations, particularly so when when if you if you look around most of the peacekeeping missions african is actually contributing quite significantly to the united nations peacekeeping mission and also some of the issues that i discussed in my presentation on how africa has contributed to the development of international law i think it's just fair that uh, not just africa but all the regions be represented fairly on 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 United Nations various bodies, not just the Security Council or the General Assembly. Thank you. Good. Tuba, have you got the next question? Yes, yeah. Thank you so much. Um, so the next question is by Josepha Frankie, um, who's a researcher from HPI, uh, an institute for media research at Germany. This question is from Mr. Subasa uh, Shimwara. The question is asking for a lay perspective, could you elaborate on what are the problems of international esports being governed only by esports publishers, which benefits are to be expected by a governing body originating in the esports community? Okay, thank you so much for question. But this question is not a lay perspective, it's that everyone confronted with these questions for, for me as well as so I try to consider uh, every day, <laughs> how can I, you know, how can I solve the problems? But your first question is not the problems because the, as you mentioned, it on, if the eSports publisher can govern 
on the international esports society, there is no problem. But the problem is there are so many actors who can govern, who try to govern the esports society. As we mentioned in, before, in the international esports governing bodies, try to govern esports society, even if there is an esports publisher who had a dominant power under the intellectual property rights, by I mean the copyrights. And then esports publishers also have the right to govern the international esports society because they, they have the copyrights. So that is a problem. So that's why I try to answer the next question. So that's why we have to create common regulatory framework in order to understand more easily for the esports players, for us legal persons, and for the, uh, the staffs in the esports governing bodies. Because I will, I will share the uh, screen, but I was surprised when I see this, uh, this, uh, okay, it's like that. That is all of the esports. <laughs> so how can we understand? Each esports community has the different policies, regulations, and rules. And for me, I was surprised when I, try, uh, when I engage in this society. I have to understand everything? No, impossible. So, so that's why we have to create a common regulatory framework in order to facilitate, to organize some events. And uh, if there is a problem, uh, we have to impose some sanctions, but each esports publishers have the different regulations and different sanctions that is not you know, the good for players, for us to understand, to organize something stuff. So that's why I try to mention, I try to present this presentation today. Thank you. Thank you yes. so much. Yes. So the next question is also from George Darlington, Hashakai, which is also for uh, Mr. Subasa. What is your opinion <laughs> on the proposed civil society envoy at the United Nations so as to promote the role and concerns of CSOs that affect humanity at the United Nations and in the global governance architecture? Thank you so much for your question. And then, uh, in fact, I don't have any ideas concerning civil society envoy at the United Nations. So that's why it's a little difficult to answer your question. But just if I can uh, say something, I think you have to define the concept of the global governance. And then after that, this is possible to use, but you can decide uh, if uh, it is possible to use the, this concept or not. But uh, so that's why at the second, uh, part of my presentation, I try to define myself, the global governance, or what is the global governance is, in order to use that concept into the inter uh, international esports society. If not, impossible. At the first thing, the global governance is a really, you know, uh, really unclear concept. So each uh, scholars, each uh, legal practitioners to say everything they want. So that's why we have to define it. And then after that, it's possible to do it. But so that's why I'm not sure my concept, my definition is correct or not. But I try to uh, take the understanding of the uh, global uh, governance and then try to use that concept into the international esports society. So I recommend you to define yourself your, uh, what your understanding is of uh, the, uh, the global governance. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, we have one last question from the audience, and I think that that's addressed to everybody, anybody from the panel can answer, and then we can also leave it open for the panelists to have a discussion uh, among themselves. This question is from Pakistan, and it's how can global governance institutions resolve the problem of legitimacy? Often there are select countries setting rules, regulations, and standards that are applicable upon the rest of the world, and costs are imposed on countries that do not comply. But how can there be improved accountability for the rule setting state? How can the countries on whom these rules are imposed be factored into decision making processes? So, anyone who wants to maybe go ahead first. I answered too much, so maybe the other <laughs> members. <laughs> yeah, it's for, it's for all the panelists, so anybody can, yeah. I'm happy to give a stab at it. Uh, I, it I was going to suggest that we pitch it to you, Marissa. <laughs> uh, I would say in terms of global governance, I think just getting the right people in the room is, is often the problem. Um, I think often what's happening is like when we're setting these standards, 
they're not in, they're not inclusive of the right people to kind of be having these discussions on, on what these standards should be and, and what the real costs are and what the real um, implementation actually requires. Um, and so I think changing just the conversation could be probably the first step. Um, and that's what I've noticed. I'm curious if others have noticed that as well. Also, you get the question of legitimacy arising in relation to uh, things like carbon capture solutions and um, strategies of um, interventions in, 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 uh, to address climate change that one state may actually impose on others. Um, injection of, into the stratosphere of agents and so on is, is one of the scarier versions of that. But um, is there a mechanism whereby you have legitimate decisions taken when, you, when it comes to climate repair uh, strategies? So, um, you know, that's another uh, an area where governance and legitimacy uh, come together. And the efficacy of solutions very much depends on, as Melissa suggests, broad stakeholder engagement and, and getting the right parties to the table. Part of it is buy-in and part of it is actually just coming up with uh, better solutions. It's, a, it's, it's kind of analogous to diversity in boardrooms where you end up with better performance. Um, and so that's, uh, that's another uh, reason, but it's a very good question and legitimacy is central to much of what we see in governance. If it's possible to say something concerning these questions, I'm try. I'm working for the esports government by esports, no, Swiss esports federation, and then I try to enhance the legitimacy in the, uh, the uh, to make the decisions in the esports federations. But I think that if we can pass the general assembly in the internet, but in the associations on the international at the international level, national level. If we can pass the General Assembly, if we can use the democratic system, maybe in that community it's possible to maintain the legitimacy because that regulation rules can be bind uh, only the members in that specific community. But if we have to extend to the extra Africa, Africa if, we are, if we consider the extra applicability, this regulation tries to you know, bind another people who are not in part of that society. That's gonna be a problem. So, yeah. <laughs> so just now I tried to solve that problem. So I just tried to add some comments. Thank you. Tuba, are there any other questions that have come up? Um, yes, two more questions are there. Um, one question is for um, Mr. Emmanuel. Yes, it's from uh, Bank Chai. I don't have a description, but I'll read out the question. Uh, it is about uh, kindly help speak on the role of the Constitutive Act of AU and R2P. How committed are the states in the observance of the critical role of regional bodies when it comes to humanitarian interventions following electoral crisis? Mr. Emmanuel, yes. Yeah. Thank, you. thank you very much um, um, for the question and thank you for bringing it up. Uh, and I think it's a very important question which has to be discussed in line with uh, in international criminal justice and the responsibility to protect. Um, the African Union, when it basically passed the Constitutive Act, for the first time, they basically took, took, took care of issues of protecting civilians in conflict and basically asking for international humanitarian intervention where war crimes and crimes against humanity is being committed. So Article 4 of the Constitutive Act provides that um, the African Union should set up um, a standby force, basically that will intervene in countries where there are conflict and where civilians are, uh, are facing um, humanitarian crisis. Um, I think this is in sync with what Kofi Annan and, and the former Secretary General of the United Nations was always campaigning for, that civilians have to be protected and it's the, it's the responsibility of um, 
government and the international community to, to, to protect civilians in times of conflict. And, and basically what he, he basically has been pushing for is to ensure that firstly, um, um, sovereignty does not supersede humanity. And in any country where um, the violations of human rights is occurring, the international community can come in and protect civilians. And I think the African Union has done this quite a lot very recently. So they intervened in Sierra Leone in, in, in the late, in the early 2000s. They've intervened in the Gambia recently to ensure that um, um, Yaya Jammeh doesn't remain in power. It's the same instrument that is being used in Burkina Faso and few other African countries where the AU is basically the arm that is being used by, by, the, by the United Nations to say, look, you can go in and protect civilians because we believe that firstly, democratic governance is at stake and when you have a dictatorship or a military regime, human rights violations will occur. So it, it, is, it is a gradual process, I think. Um, but in the last two decades, a lot has happened in terms of responsibility to protect. And it is now enshrined in the Constitutive Act of the African Union. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we just have one more question. Um, it's for Ms. Sterling. Um, what do you anticipate the challenges would be in coordinating cross-boundary water resources? That's a great question. Um, Many challenges. Um, I think one is just figuring out kind of who who the parties are, um, and also kind of the power dynamics. I think um, kind of the 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 ongoing conflict between um, Egypt and Ethiopia right now is is pretty fascinating because you have different power. You know, the who's upstream versus who's downstream makes a huge difference, um, and how that impacts water supplies, pollution, um, like just figuring out kind of who has what leverage. Um, but then there are plenty of other actors, um, international aid agencies, um, utilities, and so kind of what role they play is key. Um, because often, I think I've found that they, you can find conflicts even just between like to utilities or to aid agencies that are trying to work on the same project and they're not aligning? So, that's a great question. Good, Tuba, um, do we have time for a question from the chair? Uh, yes, I think we have. Uh, Unless anybody have... else has, has uh, put any questions forward. I've... No, no, we have no more questions from okay, the audience. I, I... So, yeah. Well, I'd like to, to just go back to Mehdi and Katerina um, with a question about, because of their, their subject expertise, the question of what do you do when you have something that's um, relatively recent scientifically, which is identification of ice reflectivity. Now that is something which stands alone and is not part of the bio, uh, biodiversity issue. Uh, there aren't very many regimes that are simply saying reflectivity is a thing, that, that is something that is hugely important, that is uh, going to be uh, damaging the, you know, as, as I was saying, other latitudes um, if it isn't addressed. But from a uh, you know, if you look at the Law of the Sea Convention uh, in the Central Arctic Ocean, you can have freedom of navigation going straight over the pole, which is, of course, what some states are, are looking forward to as, as the ice shield turns into ice cubes. Um, the other is the uh, continental shelf extension, which is almost mechanical, um, pushing all the way towards the pole with um, uh, exploitation of, of minerals and oil and gas and so on, which as of right with, with you know, questionable um, environmental considerations just handed over. So these are sort of two very powerful regimes under the Law of the Sea Convention, which go directly against more recent evidence of how important that particular physical feature is and you're left with, you know, we, we know that in, when the Law of the Sea Convention was being um, 
who was being negotiated in the 70s, this just wasn't known. This is, you know, um, and so um, what do you see as the way forward, whether it's through um, the, the biodiversity beyond a BBNJ regime or, or others? I mean, we did have a, a response to probably a, a, a kind of the most parallel physical uh, protection situation is, that comes to mind is ozone layer in Montreal Protocol. Uh, which was a very rapid response. This one's going to be more difficult, but um, what do you see as the way forward in terms of dealing with something which has come to light recently, but where the old regimes uh, are literally working against uh, uh, humanity and, and failing to protect? Over to you. Thank you so much for outlining that very important point. And... Um... So basically, the for me personally, the main way forward is like the adaptation of a more dynamic international law making or framework, which has the ability to adapt to um, recent developments. And I think that is generally the problem we also see in international negotiations that are happening right now, such as the BBNJ negotiations. Like they are focusing on areas beyond national jurisdiction, which are exactly like you say, under the um, provisions of the uh, United Nations of the law of the sea and um, give the right to every state basically to navigate in these waters and then we have like these this interface between like the relevancy of protecting the environment and biodiversity and i think personally that the cis as such or like the reflectivity of it is very much connected to biodiversity because this whole system and like the whole earth system in general is interconnected and connectivity is also has also been a point which um, became more important recently and more visible in um, academia but um, I think there is a general conflict between the necessity to adapt to the changes and then the political will and the economic interests of states. So, so far economic interests always preside over um, the environmental protection, which creates huge challenges. So I think um, the only way forward is like trying to create a more dynamic way of answering to these issues that are arising and being more flexible in that. Maybe do you have yeah. anything to add? Um, in my opinion, the, the Arctic region has been quite um, able to adapt to new, to recognize and adapt to new challenges. And that's what has been called, um, referred to the um, multifaceted Arctic governance because there are a myriad of processes and each processes are specified on one kind of issues. And for example, if you look at the uh, Arctic Council, which is a high level forum in the Arctic, uh, it is not an international organization per se, but it has done an incredible work on uh, climate, climate uh, short leaf climate forcers and highlighted these. And as a result, all of these findings could be um, integrated and presented to international fora like uh, uh, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. And there's always this capacity to adapt with adding new protocols, adding new treaties, kind of like a sectoral development, I would say, issue by issue, because it would be perhaps not efficient to deal with every issues in one treaty. And also it would take a longer time. So yeah. Yeah. Negotiations. yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, that's uh, that, that's a, a helpful uh, response and a hopeful <laughs> response. Well, uh, Tuba, uh, subject to uh, anything else, um, perhaps we can we can move towards winding up. I'll say one or two words. Um, first of all, I I 
mentioned that our problems are running away faster than we are. And the good news, and I think it's something that Mehdi has just alluded to, is that human understanding and ingenuity are capable of being responsive to problems. Uh, and not just at the level of symptoms, but on many levels, uh, particularly looking for the underlying drivers and, and more subtle forces acting upon systems. And the development of our global institutional framework, including the normative framework is crucial. And the conceptual tools that we developed, and we've seen some really interesting uh, examples of opening up uh, to new, opening up horizons, really new ways of thinking and looking at things. And, you know, the virtual water is a really good example of that, but these are vitally important. And it's why these conferences are, are so helpful. Um, there's a wonderful quote um, from uh, that that was uh, it comes from the physicist Werner Heisenberg, who said that what we see is not nature itself, but nature exposed to our method of questioning. And I think this applies in the social sciences every bit as much as it does in the physical sciences. And what it, what it means is that our framework of understanding actually determines what we see. And it also determines any blind spots that would explain why our problems are running faster than we are. So, you know, this, this is um, uh, an important inquiry. Um, Professor Dupuy recently spoke about international law as being a form of, a, of public good as part of the global commons. And it seems to me that our panelists um, from, from what our panelists have said, that we need to work together to enhance the quality of governance at every level. Uh, this is not a monolithic thing and that at local levels, national, regional and international uh, levels need to be understood working together um, because global governance really does involve all of them. Um, our organizational capacity through norms and institutions may be largely intangible, but they're fundamentally important public good in their own right. And they deserve to be recognized as such, to be refined, strengthened, uh, protected, and uh, also uh, resourced, uh, which is often the Achilles heel when we develop these wonderful systems. Anyway, I'll, I'll end there, but it remains for me to thank our panelists very much for their excellent presentations and also to the coordinators uh, who have been working very hard in the background to keep the show on the road. Uh, we hope you've enjoyed the session and I look forward to the others following on. Thank you. <laughs>